You're listening to audio from the Decidedly Podcast. For more information, find us on Instagram at Decidedly Podcast. So what do you think is the coolest thing that you've ever done or the, the big stupid goal thing that you've done? The coolest thing I've ever done, like the best experience. Yeah. Uh, ice climbing in Alaska. That was pretty sweet. Oh, that was. That's a memory I I cherish. So we we flew on a little pond hopper from Juneau to this town of Haines. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the only way to get to Haines is through a plane. Yeah. There's no roads there. There's not an interstate there, um, which was at the like the furthest point of an inlet. So there's this. Yeah. Or, is that what you call them? Bay or yeah, whatever? Yeah. Like, so anyway, there was this, it was this like long, narrow stretch of water in, in the land. It's all the way at the back of it. Anyway, we get there, we kayak across the inlet for like three miles, pull the kayaks up, hike for another three miles to this glacier that's in the middle of nowhere. You can't drive to it. You can't, you can't right. do a bus tour by this glacier. <laughs> right. I mean, it, it. you have to do what we did. You have to kayak out there and then hike. Yeah. And, and then we climbed the glacier like for three days. That was that was pretty sweet. The, the thing I remember about that experience is having never been in a glacier before is, is the caves and uh, how blue it was inside the glacier, just climbing down the crevices and through the caves. And it was just an amazing experience. Like you, you're right. We're there for three days on that glacier. Yeah, it was, it was so cool. So uh, I, in a, a lesson of what not to do from a customer service experience, I remember on the last day, yeah, our, our guide, Do uh-huh. you remember our guide? Yeah, sure. He said, I quote, you know, what's crazy. <laughs> And I said, no, what? He said, out here, you could scream bloody murder <laughs> and no one would hear you. <laughs> and I was like, bro, what the hell? I'm 12. <laughs> I, did, yeah. I, I, I remember that experience as, as we were coming off the glacier and we had the task of kayaking back three miles you know, across this, this inlet. And the swells in the water had uh, gotten significantly worse on the way back. And I, I looked at those. We were on the on the beach there, ready to kayak, and they're probably six foot swells. And I said, "That looks pretty rough." He goes, "Yeah, we're we're absolutely going to tip over." So let me show you guys how to right yourselves in the kayaks when they tip over. I said, "Hey, is there any way we can call somebody? Just have them, <laughs> have them come get us?" And he goes, "Oh, that's that's probably a solid idea." And he gets his satellite phone and he calls the guide and comes back to me he says all right well I've, I've got good news uh somebody's gonna come get us in a in a boat i'm like oh great he goes they'll be here in about eight hours <laughs> and i was like oh oh no <laughs> and so we we're sitting there in the middle of nowhere we, we can't leave this place and i was super frustrated i remember being just you know irritated I'm like god dang you know we're just stuck here this is miserable and i was really kind of angry about it until I realized I started looking around and I realized this is someone's screensaver. We are living a real life inside the most beautiful place you could probably ever be. And here's where we're going to be all day. Yeah. We saw bald Eagles. Bald Eagles landed 10 feet from us. We saw humpback whales breach in the inlet. Yeah. And, and the guide was right. No people. There were nobody there. Nobody was there. And I that turned out to be one of, I think, one of the best days I've ever had is just being there, experiencing the beauty of Alaska, and just knowing, hey, I'm, I'm at peace. This nothing is where I'm going to be. No cell phone, no yeah. nothing. Absolutely nothing a to do. Great, a great enjoy. experience. Yeah. It was really a once in a lifetime experience. Our guest today is someone who creates once in a lifetime experiences on purpose. (laughs) Uh, Steve Sims. Man, let me tell y'all about Steve because he is a character. He is the visionary founder of the world's first luxury concierge that delivers high level personalized travel 
transportation and cutting edge entertainment services to high end you know, Fortune 500 CEOs, celebrities, professional athletes. And, Dude's uh, got some stories. Yeah, the rich uh, billionaires that are so rich that you've never heard of them before. You know, so those are the type of people he's working for. He went from a a doorman at a local bar to doing that for a living. So he is about as entrepreneurial as you can get. He and his team, they create extraordinary experiences. I mean, truly once in a lifetime experiences for their clients, like singing on stage live with legendary rock band Journey, taking a submarine trip to the Titanic. He even closed the museum in Florence for a private dinner party for six people at the feet of Michelangelo's David and had legendary opera singer Andrea Bocelli come serenade the guests. Uh, truly unbelievable stuff. And he, he does have incredible stories. He's been quoted in various publications and TV, including Wall Street Journal, Forbes, London Sunday Times. He's a best-selling author of Go for Stupid, The Art of Achieving Ridiculous Goals, and Blue Fishing, the art of making things happen. A sought after consultant and a speaker at a variety of networks, groups, and associations, as well as the Pentagon and Harvard twice. We talked about really, really great stuff. Aggravations and fear lead to motivation. Nothing is impossible. It's only impossible until someone do, does it. So stop saying impossible. It's a limiting ceiling. We talked about how to gamify big goals. How our mind is trained to see what we feed it. We talked about the Pygmalion effect. Uh, a psychological phenomenon in which high expectations lead to improved performance. Talked about creating opportunities to be alone with yourself in conversation and not being terrified of making a wrong decision. Instead, being frightened of not trying. Steve is a, a one of a kind. If you're listening only, I want you to know what Steve looks like. If you don't want to Google him or check out his Instagram, he's a bald British man with a big, long gray goatee and an eyebrow piercing. He looks like he could kick my ass, but he uh, is one of like the nicest, most engaging people that we've had on the he's, show. He's a fantastic guy. So stick around. We're really proud of this one and uh, you're going to have a good time. I'm Sanger Smith, as always. I'm with my dad, Sean Smith, and this is Decidedly. Steve, I think that you are the guy that stole my first fake ID. What? <laughs> you look exactly like him. <laughs> I was 18. How was that working for you? It, it, well, I mean, it, it, it didn't get a lot of mileage, <laughs> that fake ID. But, well, thank you yeah. for lending it to me. I'll give it back soon. Well, it probably didn't do you much good, but I found out you were a bouncer in a past life, and I said, that's where I know this guy. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so I was reading that story in, in uh, Bluefish uh, about you. read a lot of the story. This is a great book, by the way. My opinion of you was this is a guy that gets stuff done. I'm wondering where, where that came from. How did you grow into the, a person who just gets stuff done? Um, well, first of all, to get stuff done, a lot of people say, oh, you know, you're risking everything. I had nothing to risk. You know, I, I, I was a doorman. I wanted to risk my future. And I think like all entrepreneurs, and I'm guaranteeing, I don't know you guys, but I'm guaranteeing you had the same thing. At some point in your life, you were aggravated. I don't like where my business is going. I don't know where I don't like where my life's going. It doesn't mean you have to be in a blind panic, but you went, hang on a minute, it can be better. And I think entrepreneurs always have that aggravation that leads to momentum to become the solution to that problem. As a bricklayer and as a bouncer, I just I wanted more. You know, I wanted my life to be rosy. When you're 17 years old, let's be blunt, you want to be a millionaire. Until you become a millionaire and then you go, crap, I'm still broke. You know, I've got the, I've got the kids' school fees to pay for. I've got the mortgage. You know, I'm not suddenly flying around in a private jet. So as you're younger, you're aggravated for more. And if you're lucky, you go on the journey to find it. Of course, as you achieve things, your standards and requirements and your aggravation stays there to able for you to get more and more and more through life. So that was it. It was just a curious yearning to better myself. I think you're right. I think most entrepreneurs are, are fighting something or there's something to prove. There's some chip on their shoulder that they all have. 100%. Yeah. I have to have an enemy. 
Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Even if you have to make it up, you just. Oh, you know. I sometimes I do. You know, like Dave Portnoy, the guy who started Barstool. Yeah. Yep. He has these champagne bottles. He engraves his enemies names on those. <laughs> I, I connected with that so much because like somebody, you know, cuts me off in traffic once and I'm like, I'm going to. You know, they never thought I could be anything like, <laughs> like they don't even know what I look like. It's like, you know, every rapper has that teacher that told them that, man, you ain't going to be shit. <laughs> like, right. like, how do you all have these teachers? Yeah. Yeah. There's always this these crappy school counselors at every rapper's high school. Yeah, nobody ever told me that. <laughs> I, remember, I remember my school counselor and we were in England. So it was a different, different system. I was very young in my school year. So I was actually 15, you know, in England, you finish school at 16 and then you go to college. Um, I was actually 15. I was very young in my year and the appointment had been made for me to go and see my school counselor regarding college programs. I walked in and my college counselor looked up at me and he went, ah, Sims, get a job. Don't worry about college. You know, it's no good. Now I don't know I look back and I don't know if they saw something in me. I can't believe they did. And they were just challenging me to make my own way. Or if they really just thought, no, you ain't going to hope in hell, mate. You know, don't even waste your time. But I remember that story when I actually lectured at Harvard and I actually told people at Harvard that my college uh, um, counselor told me to not even apply for college. And here I am teaching you goofballs. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so take that smart kid there you go that. yeah yeah so how do you how do you parlay going from you know dormant as you, as you said to running the luxury concierge service so if you if you got to to meet me i like riding motorcycles i like walking around my garden i like barbecuing drinking old fashions i'm not very exciting you know, I do like All to travel the world. All those things sound fantastic to me. I love them. I think that <laughs> yeah. highlights of my life. You know, for me, my idea of like a great Saturday afternoon is to be in a barbecue store staring at all the new barbecue gadgets. Um, right. But everyone knows me from walking the red carpets and the white carpets and hanging out with, you know, the Vatican and Elton John and Elon Musk. I always tell people I was not in the business I was in. And what that means is I was an aggravated youth that wanted to know, well, hang on a minute, all of my friends are broke. You know, how do rich people do things? And so I went out of my way to try and surround myself with successful, impactful people. And that's a drug. You meet someone that's a millionaire and you go, wow. You meet someone that's a billionaire, you go, wow. You meet someone that owns a country, you go, wow. So it just keeps escalating the people that I surrounded myself with. But- if I had to to be able to get a two-hour conversation with you over dinner or lunch or something like that, I had to get you a drum lesson by Guns N' Roses. Oh, okay. You know, I had to get you walking down the white carpet with Sir Elton John at his Oscar party. All right. I, I wasn't fascinated with that side of life because I wanted the following day when they go, hey, John, did you have a great time? Let's grab a cocktail tonight. And then I could go, how do you look at investments? How do you look at opportunity? Mm. How do you hire people? How do you delegate? Okay. You know, how do you look at time? Basically, if podcasting existed in the late 90s, I'd have never done what I did, but I did what I did purely and simply to be able to phone up the most powerful people in the planet going, hey, how did you do this? And of course, once I picked myself up from that chair after that dinner or cocktail or whatever, I would then go and use it because I may be stupid, but I'm not that dumb. My idea was to always get the advice from the most powerful people in the planet and then use it for my good. It's funny you say said that about podcasts because as you were talking, I was sitting there going, oh, man, that's what we're doing. It is what <laughs> we're doing now. You know, we, doing, man. You, right. Most podcasts, and we all know this, I've got a podcast, you've got a podcast. We get people on podcasts that we want to talk to that maybe in the no other situation we would ever have got the chance to have had a chat with. Wouldn't have ever looked my direction. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. But absolutely. it's great. It's a way of us answering. And I bring people on my podcasts that basically I want to interview for my benefit, and I'm hoping that someone else out there listening has got the same problem that's just helped them. But let's be blunt, primarily, selfishly, I want to find out how I do this from you and I'll tell other people about it. That'll help you and it helps yeah. me. 
That's what, what gets me when people uh, who don't have podcasts, they, they'll ask me about it, whether it's friends, you know, colleagues, whatever they say. Oh, so, uh, so how are you uh, monetizing that? Or how are you doing that? What's your vision? Like, dude, I don't give a shit. Like <laughs> if I don't make, if I only nope. ever spent money, it would have been worth it 100 times over. Um, because I'm talking to super cool people like you, like, you know, like senators, politicians, entrepreneurs, I've learned more than I could ever hope for. I don't have the burden of having to go create these once in a lifetime experiences to get people to show up <laughs> because the internet is like magic, right? People, people just, Oh, you got a podcast. Cool. Um, you know, maybe they check out an episode or two and go, okay, I like what these guys are talking about. And then they want to join, but you, you had to do really you extraordinary had to do things. some hard stuff. Yeah. yeah. And you talk, you talk about getting shit done. I would not know how to get the type of shit done that you talk about getting someone to sing with Andrea Bocelli, playing with Journey, all these extraordinary things. What, I mean, where do you even start? I love your attitude because your attitude would allow me to invoice you more. Um, <laughs> I, I, always, I always loved it. I would get these billionaires and it always made me, it always made me laugh. I've worked with people that owned the venues that the celebrities were performing at and they would contact me to get them backstage of their own venue. And I'd be like, why? But they just didn't know how to do it. I had people going to me going, hey, Stims, I know this is impossible, but I'd really like this. And there was nothing better I could hear for them to think that it was impossible because then all I had to do was do it. Okay. And then because you already thought it was impossible, I could charge you five times more than I was going to. So... The first thing is you've got to understand nothing's impossible. When you're in this game long enough, you know that it's only impossible until someone does it. And then finally, let's make that the last time we use that word, okay? Because mm. the second you use that word, you've given yourself an excuse. You've given yourself a cop-out. You've given yourself a ceiling, a brick wall, okay? How many times do you get people going, hey, I'm going to go for the... And we're not even going to use that word anymore. I'm going to go for the, uh, they've already told you, they've already admitted subconsciously, look, it can't be done, but hey, I'm going to pretend. I'm. Going this is why I always went for stupid. Now, the, the, the latest book, Go for Stupid, bottom line, shallow plug there, but that's an 18-year-old title. It wasn't hard when we came up with the book to have the title because people would come to us and go, hey, and you've already mentioned one of them. I want to meet the rock band journey. Well, okay. How can we make that request stupid? Now, here's the dumb thing. If I say to you, we're going to, and I'm going to use the word again for the point of this to get it through. Let's, let's come up with something that's impossible. Let's, let's break through that impossible. Let's make the possible, uh, the impossible possible. You get all you get all restrictive, don't you? You get all fired up and you get all kind of like Aah! and angry. But if I say to you, hey, I've got someone that wants to meet rock, uh, the rock band journey, how can we make that stupid? The first thing you do, and it's happened to both of you now, you smirk, you yeah. smile. Neurons crick kick in in the back of your head. Now you're a five year old gamifying the shit out of it. How can we make this ridiculous? How can we have a laugh at it? How can we come up with just something so stupid people laugh at us? And do you know what visionaries are? They're people that dream. They come yeah, up I, with stupid I like goals. that. It, and that's what it we did. Starts, yeah, it starts with the premise that it is possible, and you're going to add on things that make it extraordinary rather than starting with the premise that it can't be done, and which, removing, which blocks removing your robots. creativity. blocks your creativity. If you ask a five-year-old, you know, how do you go up in a space? He'll tell you, you know, he may say, I walk there or I'll fly. You know, he may come up with something that makes no scientific sense at the moment, but he won't let the shit of us get in the way by going, oh, that can't be done. You won't hear a four-year-old go, oh, that's impossible. You know, they will just dream up a way for it to be happening. But for some reason, and here's the dumb stuff, and I don't want to get on a soapbox, but here I go. Our society is our biggest problem. And the society puts the parameters on there of what you think you should abide by and can achieve. 
and it's usually run by a bunch of poor people. Poor people, poor stupid people are very noisy. They make up the majority of the planet, but they're freaking noisy, and they tell you what you can and can't do. See, the, I've thought of the, I've thought that for a long time. I didn't know yeah. you were allowed to say that out loud. I just did, and I, <laughs> you know, this cancel culture that got got invented during COVID in a time that we couldn't communicate. As yeah. idiots that the human race is, we invented the the gotcha society and the cancel culture, and we've cancelled a lot of people's careers that were innocent. But in the court of public opinion, it doesn't matter if you're innocent. We're going to cancel you regardless, and we're going to find a little sound bite you said, like me saying, "Poor people are noisy." Whoa, we shouldn't listen to him anymore, and we're frightened of saying the truth. Yeah. An unsuccessful, there are more unsuccessful people than successful people. And with the internet, everybody's got a voice. Um, if you've ever made the mistake of commenting on a post, <laughs> let your, let your very logical, like rooted in evidence of your own personal success comment, get torn to shreds by people who are living in their mom's basement. Oh, yeah. like those are the worst days of my life are when I get broken down like once a year and comment on something. This is what I think. And then they just get, you know, idiots filing in to be like, no, man, this is how the world works. What have you done? Nothing. Why am I, why am I letting you even influence my thought process? So you, you think thinking big, I love that. I'm kind of in a personal journey myself of with, with my own life and business of really pushing the limits on what I'm thinking. And I had to recognize um, that I was limiting my business's success with not thinking of completely stupid goals. When when you were working for these clients to come up with amazing once in a lifetime experiences, what was the one that made you feel like, okay, I really like, I really, I really nailed it. I, I don't know if I could top that. <laughs> so I've never repeated anything, um, and that's the that's the first way to make sure you can't fail. People had hear that I had done this with the rock band journey, or done this with Elton John, or done this with Guns and Roses, and they'd be like, oh, I want to do that. Nope, can't do it. Let's make your dream your dream, but I'm not going to repeat what we did for somebody else. So I was very aware some of the time that I was doing stuff like the classic one that a lot of people know the story of, and you do because you read the book. I had the client that wanted a dining experience in Florence. And so again, how can I take this dining experience and make that stupid? So we dared to dream what would be the most ridiculous way we could make a dinner in Florence so we took over the entire museum, the Academia, the Galleria, and at nine o'clock at night, set up a table of six. While they're eating that pasta at the feet of Michelangelo's David, the most iconic statue in the world, I told them, hey, I've got a local entertainer that's going to come and serenade you while you're eating the main course, and I wandered in with Andrea Bocelli. Now, every single one of those moments, the chef, the museum, the location, Andrea Bocelli, I went in as that being the, the A goal to get this to happen. And if I failed, then I would come up with a B plan. But I never, ever walked into anything with a plan B. You know, it mm. was, this is what I want. If it doesn't work, I'll sort something, but this is what I want. And it's like the little kid asking for the lollipop at dinner time. No, 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 dinner time's coming soon, but I want a lollipop. Wait for your dinner, but I want a lollipop. You won't want your dinner if you have a lollipop. I know, but I want a lollipop. You know, they, they just have one single focus. Nine times out of ten, those little bastards, they get the lollipop. So with me, I had that A plan and that focus. Now, I didn't always get it. And in fact, a lot of times in life, I didn't get it. But it's the classic, go for the moon, achieve a certain you know group of stars on the way down. When I started going for things, as I got more and more confident, more and more respected and branded as the man that could, I would walk in and when I when I asked for that museum to shut down, they were like, oh, great, okay. And I remember sitting there going, shit, I just got it. And I remember speaking to Andrea Bocelli and they were like, yeah, okay, we'll be there. Crap, how did that come off? So there was a lot of times that I would do stuff and there's actually, I don't know if I mentioned it in the book, but there was a moment that I'll never forget. I was in Florence at the back of the um, the academia where Michelangelo's David was, and there's a pedestal 
that's built into the wall that goes around the back yeah. of David. And I'm sat on it, and next to me is Andrea Bocelli and Veronica Bocelli, and right in front of me is the profile of David. That's setting up the piano, that's setting up the table, and I own the entire museum myself. And all of a sudden, I shuddered. You know when they say, oh, someone walked over your grave, and you just yeah. suddenly shudder? I shuddered so much that Andrea Bocelli could feel it in the legs. And he looked at Veronica and said something to her in Italian. She said, are you okay? And I said, you know, I've just realized where I am and who I'm next to and what we pulled off. And I just had a moment. I just, so, you, you end up as an entrepreneur fighting for things and coming up mm -hmm. with these ideas and spinning the wheel and I want to do this. And then all of a sudden you get it and you go, bloody hell, how did I get that? And I had that moment next to Andrea Bocelli. Wow. When you look at opportunities to create stupid goals, <laughs> what decisions do people have to make to take their goals and elevate them like that? So it's funny you actually questioned it like that. So have you ever been in a parking garage or in a dealership lot for a car and you've come across this car and it's a weird funky color? It may be like a funny green or a pale mm -hmm. blue or a yellow. You look at this car and you go, well, that's weird. I've never seen that before. And on a car, well, that's weird. But when you drive home, what's the only color car you can see on the road? It's that color, that isn't it? That goofy color, yeah. It's that color. Our mind gets trained to see what we feed it. Now, when you start looking at things differently, when you start challenging what's possible and plausible, when you start pushing your boundaries of what you can conceive, what you can dream, and what you will accept as your standards, that's all your mind can see. When you train it to be open to opportunity, the only thing it can see on a day-to-day -day drive is opportunity. All of a sudden, what you would have accepted a month ago, that's in the rear view mirror. I don't see that. Now. I see what happens. It's like when you get your first big deal. It's like when you get your first big whale client. It's when you yeah. hit your first marketing strategy that just goes crazy and you hit it or your first video goes viral. You go, whoa, this is what it looks like? All right, that's my new benchmark. Yeah, and that's yeah I'll, I'll, tell you the, I'll, I'll tell you the reason that I ask that question is, is that as a financial advisor, I work with clients all the time who are to a point in life financially where they have resources to do whatever they want. What I've found is that the habits that they've created through their lifetime of being frugal, holding down those expectations, uh, living within their means don't change all of a sudden when they arrive at this financial point of financial independence. And so I talk with them all the time, but you know, okay, you're going to go to Europe, fly first class. Oh, you know, we're not that type of people. Or, you know, no, take the whole family on the cruise with you. It's okay. You have the money. And I, and I come up against these mental roadblocks with them as I'm trying to encourage people to think big, to have stupid goals. And it's difficult for some people to think that way. I don't know. You kind of get them too late. Oh, like, that may be. You get yeah, them too late. Be. It, it, because if they were thinking that way while they were working, they would have the money to be flying first class before they retired, right? They would have had money to to buy the supercar before they were 75. Um, I, I, think, I think that's, in some way, people, it, they need a little bit extra motivation um, and, and, when they get to that point in life, it's like some people are never going to, never going to think different. Never I'm not quite sure if thought. it's the, I, don't know. I, I kind of agree with what you say, but you're both right. It's not the motivation it's the generational acceptance. Now, if you're talking to a 70 year old, 80 year old, 90 year old, they were raised in a society where let's be blunt. They only just came out of world wars where they had yeah. to be a lot more frugal. They had to be a lot mm. more careful. And, and those people were raised in the, in the ethos of get a job, work your way through that job, build up a pension, yeah. and then one day you can retire. We're raising kids now that go, hang on a minute, there will be no retirement fund for me. I've got to make my own retirement fund. And hey, why should I wait to 75 to experience this, to enjoy this? 
and we're we're dealing with different mentalities because social parameters are changing and i think it's very generational i think now speaking to an 18 year old he's not going to be well look i'll work 40 years and then i'll get a sports car he's going to be like hang on a minute look at the look at my opportunities to me today to be able to get my sports car in 3 years time yeah, mindset's a huge part of it, right? Yeah. For the for the people who were born in the 30s or the 40s, it was a mortal sin to waste one nickel. Right? Yeah, and now it's now you know the the rub against uh, people growing up today is they blow half their income on coffee shops or <laughs> whatever. Well, it is. Sean, let let me pick it, on you for a second. How old are you, Sean? Uh, 58. Fifty eight. So I'm fifty six. So we're both the same. Do you remember in the 80s and 90s? A dirty word was entrepreneur. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah. If you yeah. said to anyone in the 80s and 90s, oh, yeah, I'm an entrepreneur, that meant you were selling stolen car radios out of the back of your car. Oh, when I, so I, I, I went and got my MBA. No professor, no administrator wanted us to go into sales or in business for ourselves. Dirty. They all wanted us to go dirty. work for big eight accounting or yep. you know, consulting firms or whatever. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't popular. No, in I feel England, like in England we had a TV show called Only Fools and Horses, which openly depicted entrepreneurs as stupid scammers that basically couldn't go anywhere. And the whole <laughs> show was on the fact that everything they tried failed. And we laughed. It was a comedy. Now, yeah, at yeah. our age, Sean, when we were in school, we wanted to be footballers, we wanted to be pop stars, rock stars, actors. But you ask kids today, what do you want to be? I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to be Elon Musk. I want to be Jeff Bezos. I want to be, you know, Logan Paul. You know, all of these people are entrepreneurs. Those are the rock stars of today. And they're giving people today permission to do things differently. I think that um, you were talking about some people who, who uh, or, or like professors that poo-poo the idea of going right. into business for yeah. yourself. My conspiracy theory is that there's no reason for them to be motivated to tell you that when the the billboard was donated by <laughs> fucking well, Pfizer. You're, or you're, you're, yeah, you're probably like, right about they that. Want, yeah. They want you to go work for the people that are funding their little projects. So, yeah, that might you be know, right. you go to accounting school and they, they don't tell you you can go be a CPA and run your own practice. They say you need to go work for Deloitte. Yeah. Here's you the know, funny thing. Here's the funny thing, because my son, we own a we own a media company called Sims Media, Sims.media. My son's 26 years old, okay? And he wanted to go to college. And he didn't he didn't want to get into like the owner operator entrepreneurial world because let's be serious, you look at dad, and I'm okay now, but the 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 root of an entrepreneur is very rocky and it's very violent and it's very, yeah. you know, all over the place. And it can be very scary until you start coming out at the other end. He didn't want any of that. But when he was going for college, he was looking at setting up a business. And I think he was trying to get a loan for like 30 grand. No one would touch him with a barge pole. Nobody. But the second you want to go to college, something that doesn't generate an income, he could get a quarter of a million dollar loan. Yeah. You know, in today's society, they'll lend you money as long as you follow the system. But the second you want to, 30 grand he couldn't get, but he could sign on the dotted line and get in debt for a quarter of a mil. That, there's yeah. something messed up with that. There's something, though, to say about the people who are extraordinarily successful, um, both of y'all or, I mean, take it even further, Musk, Bezos, that part of why they're so successful is because it was not encouraged, right? Because those are the people who said, despite the lack of opportunity, despite everybody's judgment, despite everybody thinking I'm going to fail, I'm going to do it anyway. So they then in already at step one have the grit necessary to necessary to make it right. And yep. if you, if we encourage it, Oh, it's great. Go give it a shot. Go try it out. I think that you probably have a lower success rate because the barrier to entry of which used to be only, do you have the grit to do something against the social norms that's gone? And there is truly no barrier to entry. So I don't know if that is going to, if we're going to see any sort of impact on the entrepreneurial landscape, but I think the way that we can combat that is to figure out if you're a young entrepreneur now, what areas can I go to that are not, maybe being an entrepreneur itself is not taboo, but there are industries that are 
maybe taboo or frowned upon because whatever what whatever is going to be successful and make the next bezos is not what we all agree upon is going to be the next thing right when when bill gates was tinkering with computers it's not like people were sitting there going well these computers are going to be real big one day let's just check it <laughs> let's, let's wait for him let's check back on bill in 25 years nobody said that they said yeah, loser <laughs> yeah. so what are people saying uh, you know what are people dismissing now that you think is going to be giving us the next billionaires well i think you're right i think the beautiful thing is the the entrepreneur looks in a pile of shit for for the diamond and the the average person goes i don't want to put my hand in there it's smelly as entrepreneurs and i damon john did a, a book on the power of broke and it's it's good and strange, and I'm sure both of you, both of you are old enough to probably be able to kind of talk on this yourself. It's some of those moments where the shit hit the fan that we got our greatest growth and empowerment. It's those moments where things didn't work to plan. It's where we got a smack in the wrong direction. It's where my son got turned down for a loan. Those moments that you go, oh, I wish it happened, that it doesn't, that you get to look back on and go, well, hang on a minute, that was I'm pretty glad that that didn't happen because it gave me the push. Everyone laughing at me gave me the judgment. Let's swing mm -hmm. back to the beginning of this. Every teacher that told that rapper, you ain't shit, may have well been the incubus, may have well been the tripwire that got them to go, well, screw you. Going to practice yeah. my lyrics at lunchtime and I'm going to prove you wrong I wonder how many teachers out there going, you are going to be huge. You are going to be fantastic. And spoke to those people that are now flipping us uh, burgers in the local McDonald's. Yeah. In, in some way, I feel like uh, giving people that encouragement and telling them exactly what their potential is, is, is counterproductive. Actually, it can... I think I'm going to quickly look for how you, you say it. Um, let me see. Um, Pag oh God, this is where I get told off for saying something wrong. Uh, the Pagmelian effect, have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. Right. You now, have? Sean, am I, yeah. am I saying it wrong? Yeah, Pygmalion effect. Pygmalion effect. I read, people send me all of this stuff and I love reading up on it. So, Sean, do you want to tell them what it is? My understanding of that is that you rise to your level of incompetence. <laughs> I read it from a a test that they did in college and they they basically took took a small percentage of the college students and said you haven't got to worry about this course too much because you're already gifted and talented you're going to fly through it you know and then they focused on the other group and went you're going to have trouble with this so let's spend more time with you and it mm -hmm. was your mindset on what you felt you could actually handle that actually provided a result. Those people that they actually said, you ain't got to worry about this, passed everything. Those people that were already initiated with, hey, this is going to be a problem for you, so let's focus, carried it and treated it like it was a problem. They did that with teachers, and the, the research was that they had, they broke a group of students into two groups. They told this one teacher, you have the high achieving students, you have the honor students, yep. the ones that scored the best on this test. And the other ones, they said you had the people that were kind of at the lower end of the scale. And they, they found that the group that they had told the teacher they had the higher achieving scores actually performed better in terms of their reading level improvement than the other group. The, yep. the issue was both of those groups were randomly distributed. There, so there they, wasn't a high and low. The, the the first group of teachers that were told they had the gifted and intelligent students did better because their expectation their, of what... Yeah, you rise happen. to your level of expectation. Yeah. So the, the teachers expected that these students would okay. do better, yeah. and they did. Now, oh, that's so that kind of goes... That's outside sources. That's outside parameters. That's us telling teachers those students are going to be good or bad. But they have to believe it. They what the students, the teacher, right? Oh, because the teacher, if I tell yeah. if I tell a little kid you're going to be great, you're going to be president one day, and that kid doesn't believe it, then I don't think that the, the Pygmalion effect. Correct, comes in play. and that yeah, that's not the, the the Pygmalion effect is an outside source of credibility. So having the teacher look at you as you're the gifted kids, it's kind of like whoa, you know, if the teacher thinks that we're the gifted kids, we must be the gifted kids. The point I want to get to is actually one step further on from that. 
where we're the teacher. The downside today is that we listen to ourselves too much and we get it wrong. How many times do you have people that are actually gifted that go, oh, I want to do that, uh, but I can't, I, and they talk themselves out of it. Mm-hmm. I ride motorcycles all the time, all the time, and I swear I could be locked up if there was a little camera in my helmet mm-hmm. because when I'm cruising down the road, and I, I had a speaking gig in San Diego last week, and my wife was like, oh, do you want to borrow the car? Because I don't have a car. I, as I say, I ride motorbikes. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm riding the bike. And she's like, it's a three-hour drive. Do you really want to ride for three hours? And I went, I absolutely do. You're like, there's nothing more in life I want to do. Than there is, yeah, I don't, I'm going, I don't care if the speaking gig gets canceled. I'm still doing right. it just to check if it's still on. I rode all the way down there for three hours. I did my gig and I rode all the way back for three hours. And I was alone with me, my thoughts, and my conversation. And that's a moment where I'm able to converse with myself and go, hey, am I doing what I want to be doing at the moment? Do I like what I'm doing at the moment? Do I like my clients? Hey, why don't we change this? And you can kind of get all of your negativity on board. So you haven't got any little doubting Thomases. There's a lot of people out there that they walk into a room and they feel as though they don't belong. And if they feel as though they don't belong, they don't belong. It's the classic, if you think you're right or wrong, you're right. You know, if you believe it, Mm -hmm. it's true. So those are times when you need to have conversations with yourself and go, hey, are you happy with your life at the moment? No. Then what are you going to do about it? What are you going to change? And when that little doubt comes up going, oh, stick to your lane, know your place, and all that bullshit, that's when you go, well, hang on a minute. Let's make our own lane. Let's build our yeah. own sand yeah. pit. And that's what you got to do today. You got to have the conversation with yourself before you take it out. So people, it out. people need, I think that people need a level of confidence to be able to think that way, right? Um, to be able to think, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to achieve this level of success and rise to the expectations that I'm setting for myself. Part of why people have limiting beliefs is they don't expect much of themselves. There was a time where I legitimately thought, the most that I was going to be was a truck driver. Almost all of high school and into college, I was like, school sucks. I'm not very good at it. Everyone tells me I'm smart, but I didn't believe it. I thought everyone was lying to me. That was what I had convinced myself. Convinced myself that everyone was lying to me. I'm going to just drive a truck because that sounds kind of fun. Um, And, you know, I'll I'll make $50,000 a year and I'll have enough to not be broke. And uh, I had to kind of get out of that. But getting out of that comes with building confidence. Um, John Donaher is a, a world champion jiu-jitsu coach. He's coached the greatest of all time mixed martial arts athlete, George St. Pierre, and the greatest of all time jiu-jitsu athlete in Gordon Ryan. It's really hard to coach someone to be the best of all time in their sport. He did it in two different sports. And he says that confidence doesn't come from just thinking you can or just believing that you can, which is what a lot of coaches or speakers might tell you. They'll tell you, oh, you know, just manifest your confidence. He says confidence comes from repeated successful attempts in an environment that most closely resembles. I wondered if you were going to get there. Yeah. Perfect. So how do you, But my question for you, Steve, is how do you replicate that for someone that's thinking big as an entrepreneur? I am so proud that you actually finished that story and completed it. People look at confidence. Confidence is repetition of experience and getting the results you want. It's very hard for people to get confidence when they haven't started the repetition, haven't started the thing. So here's the thing. Fear should be what drives you. You know, are you happy where you are? Then do something about it. I love this shit. The the, the point is, I'm not frightened of failing. I'm not frightened of screwing up. I'm not frightened of making a bad decision. I'm frightened of not trying. I'm frightened that in six months time, I'm going to be in exactly the same place that I am now. Now, financially happy house, hills, family, travel. I'm happy. But I learned years ago, the definition of hell is to meet the man or woman that you could have been. That Mm. drives me. Yeah, that's tough. It reminded me of, uh, there was this viral video going around of Jamal Hill who just recently won the UFC light heavyweight championship. And he was saying, 
man, the only reason I ever did this was because I wanted to know how good can I be? Yep. That's all I, I just want to know. That's all you need. And so he said ahead of this fight that like, I mean, even just a year ago, if you told, you know, anyone that knew anything about UFC fighting, um, Jamal Hill is going to be the champion. They'd be like, who? Uh, <laughs> so he said, I can't lose. I can't lose because no matter what, if I win or if I lose, I least and I know if I was good enough. And yeah, I'm I'm right there with you, man. I that beautifully said that. That drive to know, hey, at least, at least at the end of all this, I'm gonna know what I could have been because I will be that thing. Uh, I will be that person. I did a speech. I did a. Funny enough, it was in San Diego again, and I was talking about the power of fear. Now, a lot of people use fear to stop them doing things, you know? So I played an example. I walked on stage, and this is how I opened up. I walked on stage, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, run out these back doors. There are five women out there. They have a quarter of a million dollars in each one of their suitcases. This is the fastest way for you to get a quarter of a million dollars towards your dreams. I'll shut up now. Go and get it. How many of, of the people in the room do you think actually jumped up and run out that door to grab that suitcase? Single digits. There were a couple of people at the back that just ended up leaning against the door and thought, well, I better look, you know, and just yeah. kind of like unlocked it. Everyone at the front stayed stationary. No one at the front of- even moved because oh. they were like, I, I'm not going to make it out there. But even the people at the back of the room were kind of like, oh, who's this guy? Because no one knew who I was. Yeah. So I had no credibility, no notoriety. There was I had no impact that you would listen to me. So they all sat there and I let this fester and I let it go on for 10 minutes. Anyone that's spoken on stage and you talk about fighting, I oh, used that's to fight, forever. That's an eternity. <laughs> I used yeah. to fight kickboxing and two minutes in a ring is a long bloody time. <laughs> 10 minutes on a stage where I'm literally just stood there and I got my phone out. And I'm checking my emails and I'm watching the 10 minute clock and the noise in the audience is getting louder and louder. And then I said to him, okay, I'm going to now say one word and I want to know your reaction. And I leant into the mic and I went, fire. And in that situation, everyone knows that if that had been the first word that I had actually mentioned in that... Everyone would have hauled ass out of those back doors. But nobody runs to an opportunity. They run from pain. Now, Mm. if you can reframe it, the pain is what you've got now. Are you happy with your life? Are you happy with your clients? Are you happy with your prospects? Are you happy with your marketing? And I'm guaranteeing you, every single person that's listening to this podcast is not. Because if they were, they wouldn't be listening to this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> everyone needs to work and understand that where they are now is the pain. Let's do something about it and get the fuck away from it. That's what you got to do. That's how it should actually propel you. Shouldn't stop you. Should actually momentum you to get to where you need to be. So what, what about if the things in my life are not bad? I mean, my life, my house is pretty nice and business is running pretty well. I mean, am I, am I getting all the leads that I could? No, but I'm not starving. You know, um, business is growing. Everything's going well, but I still want that. I want to create that fear that's going to motivate me to achieve my full potential because between ground zero and my full potential, there's a big valley of complacency where everything's comfortable and I got a lot of money and success, but I'm still not where I could be. Now, you know that's the biggest pile of bullshit you could have actually come up with. Because, How? Because you're sitting there going, my house is nice. It, it, it's kind of, everything about your mannerisms. So nobody, nobody's, ever, nobody's ever gotten complacent with, a, with a, a nice, happy, fat life where they can they eat wouldn't well be They and- wouldn't be listening to this podcast. You wouldn't be doing this podcast if you were settled. Okay, fair enough. The, the point is, it's your standards. And your standards yeah. don't have to be, hey, I'm only going to drive a Ferrari. You could be at McDonald's and get a cold bunch of fries and you just, I'm not going to settle for that. Excuse me, these fries are cold. Could you give me a fresh batch? I go, I'm go. i notorious for drinking old fashions. Someone gives me a shit old fashioned and I'm like, excuse me, 
this isn't what I'm accustomed to. Do you know how to make an old fashioned or is there someone else that can make me one? Or can I suggest how you can make this a good old fashioned? I guess you've got I guess what to I'm manage saying, your standards. It's like, so I guess there's what I'm thinking, Steve is I get my question is how do, how do you raise your standards when what motivated you when you were starting out was, man, I'm sick of eating ramen noodles. I'm sick of okay. not turning the heat on in the winter. And then you, then you get to the point where you're eating steak every night, but you're still not achieving your potential. How do you, how do you, how do you create new fears? Well, the beautiful thing is at the end of that statement, again, it was like, you're still not getting, there's that, if you listen and you watch how you're saying it, you're, you still end every sentence with aggravation. Aggravation, <laughs> there's the, the, the classic one of Joe Polish said it's aggravated oysters to make pearls. Yeah. You know, you're not sitting there going, hey, I've got the biggest freaking house I could ever want. I've got so many cars, I just don't even know what to drive in the morning. i got so much money that I can't count it, you know. You're not saying those things. At the end of everything you're saying, you're like, but, but you know, I, I want to do – you've got the aggravation in you. And I think yeah. people need to own that aggravation. It's when you're aggravated – and, again, th this is the beautiful thing. You've got a great house. You've got a yeah. great business but you can do more with it. That entrepreneur in you goes, I can make this from good to great. Yeah. And it's that aggravation of not willing to sell. I've got a great life. I literally arrogantly can stop working now and I'm fine. But am I? So what I'm are you one, afraid of then? What? Not growing. You, you, my direct question is not growing. When you stop you become stagnant, stink, and die. Yes. I am terrified, literally terrified of not trying, not engaging in these conversations, not trying something different. I released a second book. I hated doing the first one. You know? <laughs> I'm right. like, it's so relatable. Oh, Writing God, a book I've sucks never, so much. I have never... <laughs> I'm trying to... I know some very, very successful authors that literally hate the process of writing a book. They love the process and what they get out of it, but they hate the book. Yeah. It's like you, I think it, you want to be slim, but you hate going to the gym. You know, I think I hate thing. the process of everything that's working well in my life. <laughs> that's probably right. I hate eating healthy. I well, hate I hate going to the gym. I hate <laughs> I hate the discipline that I implement in my business. Like I hate everything that I'm doing that is working. The things that I like are the things that I don't let myself do, like eat ice cream and sit on the couch and watch Netflix. I like that. I don't like, I don't like writing. It's brutal. Yeah. There's, there are a lot of people who, who want to do what you do, but they don't want to do what you did. Oh, nobody wants to. Yeah. Know yeah. what you do, what you do. All right. So I, I have a, I know we got to wrap in a few minutes, Steve. What is the big stupid goal you're working on right now? What's your next big stupid goal? Oh, anyone listening? Um, I've got to a point where I'm very concerned with the way that us as a society are jeering at people rather than challenging them. You know, I want people to actually surround themselves with great people. So the whole point of me and my mission and my movement is to get people to think of doing things differently. I want anyone that's listening to this show to look around at the people in your circle and go, hey, do they support me? Do they challenge me? Do they push me? Do they inspire me? No? Then leave that sandpit and find yourself a new room. You know, I want, and that's why they listen to these podcasts because they want to surround themselves with inspiring ideas that they can go, hang on a minute. I can challenge myself more. I can be better than where I am. It doesn't mean I'm in a bad place. It just means yeah. I can be better. So for me, I want to inspire people to do that. I want to challenge people to do that. And I want to get a movement going where we stop laughing at people and we start challenging each other. I love that. That's a great goal. 100%. Let's Thank you so much for being here. It can happen because of you guys. You guys bringing people onto your show to get people to think and act differently. I just don't want people to listen to it and not action it. So thank you very much for having me, guys. Where can people find more about uh, the work that you're doing? Oh, I'm really easy to find. I am Steve D. Sims, absolutely everywhere in the planet. SteveDSims.com, whatever social you like to consume. I am Steve D. Sims on a D for dashing and only one M in Sims. And I'll pop up. Great. Cool. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. I really enjoyed talking with Steve Sims. That was a lot of fun. The decision-making learning I got from that, my takeaway, is 
looking at having fear drive you to make decisions towards action rather than having fear cause you to be in a point of inaction. In other words, if my if I have a fear of looking foolish, rather than having that prevent me from moving forward or doing something or striving for a stupid goal, have that fear of looking foolish cause me to decide to practice, to improve, to get better so that I don't. So that that's where I that's what I took away from mm, my decision. Inverting the inverting the fear. I like yeah. that a lot. My takeaway was the Pygmalion effect. I had not heard of it. Uh, you had. It's a psychological phenomenon in which high expectations lead to improved performance. So what I kind of thought about when it comes to that is that if I expect more of myself, then I, I can achieve that. And and if I expect more out of you know the people I'm leading, then maybe they can achieve more also. So I really enjoyed our conversation around the Pygmalion effect. And I think that there's a way to kind of hack that for mm-hmm. ourselves. Mm-hmm. You just made a great decision to listen to this episode of Decidedly. Make another great decision and leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support. It helps others find our community and defeat bad decision-making in their own lives. For more daily decision-making insights, check us out at decidedlypodcast.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Decidedly Podcast. Thanks again for listening. I'm Sanger Smith, and this is Decidedly. Insights, advice, and comments provided by Sean Smith, Sanger Smith, and speakers identified as part of the Decidedly podcast should not be considered recommendations. Speakers not identified as members of Decidedly are expressing their opinion, and their statements should not be construed as reflecting the views of the Decidedly team. This podcast is produced solely for informational purposes, not personalized advice.